Life expectancy was so much shorter in the 19th century, which historically isn't really that long ago. The rich in um, you know, the Victorian era were expected to live until 45, and day laborers were expected to live till 25, and now we're you know, edging on 90. It has some cultural ramifications, and some of them I view to be negative. With the elongation of lifespan, with the um, professionalization of the funeral industry, and that most people now die in hospitals instead of dying at home, culturally, we're very removed from death. A lot of people have very limited interactions with death where it used to be around all the time, and I think it's causing us some psychological issues of death denial. You know, you would take care of your loved ones. You would have dead bodies laid out in your parlor, and even, you know, in the 1930s, they changed the name of the parlor to the living room because it was for the living, not for the dead. Most children did not make it past five. Death was very much part of life, and you were right in there with it. And now we have all these ways to completely divorce ourselves from it, except that we can't really do that because people in our lives do die eventually, even if it ends up being at age 100 in a care facility or a hospital. Um, your grief is still there. Your, you still have to figure out how to deal with it, how to deal with the loss, how to deal logistically with things. And it's considered, it's now considered impolite to talk about, and people don't know how to manage that. One of the biggest turning points was the American Civil War. This was the first time young men were dying away from home, because before you'd be tended to by your loved ones, put in the ground by them in a shroud or maybe a pine box and, you know, no embalming, none of that stuff. Surgeons on the battlefield became experts and created new methods of embalming in order to keep the bodies preserved just long enough to take the train back to their loved ones so that they could be buried in their, in their home. Abraham Lincoln was embalmed many, many times and took a uh, train tour. His body took a train tour so everyone could see it. Over time, it, you know, the expectation that a body looked lifelike and the way to achieve that was through embalming. That was sort of how that started. And embalming never really took off in the same way in any other country. The American conception of what you know, traditional burial is, rolling bucolic country cemeteries, the embalmed bodies made up uh, and put on display didn't happen before the mid 19th century. I knew I wasn't really into the burial thing. The idea of taking up real estate forever seemed really wasteful and, and you know, not for me. Um, and then I thought, well, if I, you know, I'm spending my life in the service of teaching medical students. That's my career now, that's what I do. And so it seems kind of a poetic justice thing to have your final act be in the service of teaching medical students. So I decided I would donate my body to my institution. When you make a decision like that, you think like, oh, okay, done, no big deal. Then you find out, uh, you know, as you really look into it, that things are a lot more complicated. For instance, I'm an organ donor. And if you're an organ donor, if they actually are able to harvest organs from you, you can't donate your body to science because you're incomplete. It would not be uh, educationally useful. Um, so I was like, okay, well, I guess plan A, if I'm able to save lives of people who need something, then that should be first. And then donation to science is actually my plan B. To me, the best things in life are either useful or beautiful or both. 
and if you could see a death as being both useful in that it helps others either by literally saving lives or by being a learning experience and beautiful in that there's thought there's a good thoughtful sentiment behind it then that would be a good death to me.